francesa, Man Ray fez um portfólio monumental e imaginativo sobre eletricidade. Uma foto do olho de Lee Miller foi a base para a perturbadora criação de um metrônomo com o título hostil de Objeto para ser destruído. Pegue a fotografia de alguém que se amou, mas que não é mais visto. Man Ray escreveu, e então o destrua com um único golpe de martelo. O surrealismo às vésperas da Segunda Guerra Mundial, a fuga para Nova York, o sucesso finalmente. É o... Na segunda metade dos anos 30, Man Ray começou uma relação com uma dançarina de Guadalupe, Adriane Fidelin. A Dia acompanhou Man Ray a Mujan, perto de Cannes, no sul da França, onde ele relaxou com os amigos durante o verão. Entre eles, o poeta Paul Eloi. E Pablo Picasso. Contudo, a ameaça da guerra pairava sobre tudo. Em 1939, Man Ray regressou a uma Paris temerosa do conflito que se aproximava. Os sinais de guerra iminente estavam por toda parte. Em seu estúdio, Man Ray criou sua pintura surrealista ideal e lhe deu o irônico título de Le Beau Temps, Tempo Bom. Este é meu trabalho mais representativo, Man Ray escreveu, e o clímax de meu período surrealista. Le Botin foi o resultado de seus pesadelos às vésperas da guerra. Duas árvores frutíferas estão tristemente nuas. O muro protetor foi partido por uma bala de canhão. O Arlequim é o próprio Man Ray. André Breton o chamou de o homem com a cabeça de lanterna mágica. Ele hesita na hora de cruzar a soleira ensanguentada e adentrar um mundo futuro e desconhecido, onde, espera ele, um novo romance o aguarda. Na escuridão, as bestas da guerra lutando até a morte obscurecem a paz efêmera de amantes condenados. So I closed my studios. In 1940, when the Germans came in, I said, everything is finished for me. I spent 20 years in Paris, and I left everything, and I went back to America, and I left even my paintings here in the care of friends, of my dealers who handled my, who gave me, sold me colors and canvas. They hid all my things, and I found them seven years afterwards. Após uma arriscada fuga através da França, Man Ray chegou a Nova York em 16 de agosto de 1940. Ele não queria ficar em Nova York, onde havia sido rejeitado pelo mundo da arte duas décadas antes. When he came to America, he came and stayed with us. And somehow he wanted to go out west. He did not want to stay. He wanted to get as far away from the war as he could. So He decided to go to California, and coincidentally, my mother knew someone who was driving out to California, and this man happened to be a tie salesman. He would stop, and he'd take all his ties out, and then would sit there and watch this time after time after time, and that was the end of the ties, as far as he was concerned. At the end of the trip, the man threw out all his ties and went and bought a shoe string and for the next 20 odd 30 years he never wore a tie he always wore a shoe string atrás da fachada sem graça deste prédio no centro de hollywood man ray achou um atraente recanto que lhe serviria de esconderijo durante a década seguinte 
O apartamento de dois andares era seu lar e ateliê, onde ele pôde continuar seu trabalho de criação. A sorte, sempre sua amiga, veio a seu socorro mais uma vez. Em um encontro às cegas, Man Ray conheceu Juliette Browner, uma jovem dançarina do Bronx, a deriva, como ele, nesta cidade estranha. Pouco depois, Juliette foi morar com Man Ray. Ela era uma acompanhante de fala macia e uma graciosa modelo. Man Ray homenageou-a apaixonadamente com uma série de retratos. Mas eles estavam longe dos Botan, os bons tempos de Man Ray. A Califórnia, ele disse, era uma linda prisão. Tentativas de aproveitar sua reputação foram infrutíferas. Estúdios de cinema não contratavam cineastas de vanguarda. Ele conseguiu um único trabalho, pintar o retrato de Ava Gardner para um filme. Sua paixão por xadrez, um hábito surrealista, levou Man Ray a outra fonte de renda. Ele fez e vendeu desenhos exclusivos para peças de xadrez que viriam a ser disputadas por colecionadores. A artista Dorothea Tanning fez uma visita surpresa a ele, acompanhada por Max Ernst, velho amigo de Man Ray. When Max and I decided to go to Hollywood, from Arizona, where we lived, we had two things in mind. One was to visit Man and Julie, and the other was to get married. When we told Man Ray that we were going to get married, he laughed hugely and uh, thought it was very funny. But the next morning when we started out, he said, well, if Max can do it, I could do it too. And he grabbed Julie. We went to the license bureau, and the woman behind the desk was accustomed to these movie people coming in. So they had a bevy of newsmen behind the desk waiting for someone famous. And she must have pressed a little button thinking we were. And then they started chasing us around. It was all very exciting. We had to get married uh, somewhere. So we drove to Beverly Hills, got married there by a judge. No, nobody had a ring. Oh, somebody had a ring. We passed the ring around, so we might have been well married to each other. William Copley, um californiano rico e herdeiro de um império jornalístico, acreditava ardentemente na vanguarda. Ele programou várias exposições dos trabalhos de Man Ray. Mas o clima artístico não era apropriado. Nada foi vendido na Copley Gallery, que teve vida curta. Só havia uma coisa que Man Ray podia fazer. Voltar à cidade que havia sido seu verdadeiro lar, Paris. De volta à sua amada cidade, Man Ray achou um lugar para si no já conhecido Montparnasse, em uma pequena rua perto dos jardins de Luxemburgo, a Rio Ferro. It had belonged to a sculptor who had vacated. He needed the height for his big pieces of sculpture. But also, the studio was really built in the space between two buildings. He picked the space originally because it was conducive to the kind of work he wanted to do. Coming into the studio, at first you're amazed at the bareness of comfortable things. He really couldn't afford to find a studio that had all the comforts. There were no windows below. The windows were only on the second level, where he had a balcony, where he kept his work. He had suspended from the ceiling halfway down a draped white curtain, like wings of an angel tied up to the roof. And down below, man was able to build living quarters out of it, studio out of it, kitchen facilities out of it. And he did this in a very inventive way. When winter came, it was freezing. It was 
six to eight degrees centigrade. And we had to get that oil stove. Every morning he'd get up and fill it with a jerry can. That's winter. I would make breakfast and take it to bed. We would have breakfast in bed. Body heat. <laughs> Dreams were very important to him. He dreamt all the time, and in the morning he had a sketch pad. He would sketch his dreams, and then he'd have the sketches and he'd make a painting. All his work was all around. You would look at some of the stuff and you'd think it was junk because they were objects, they were all together, and they were odd things that you, you, there was no real, you couldn't understand what it was. It looked like a junk heap in some places. But if you pulled individual things out, out came magic. We were sitting around having breakfast one morning. A man was staying with us, and we were bantering about this, that, and the other thing. And somehow the idea of wig came up. And at that point, the wigs were, women were wearing wigs, and they were, they were very popular at the time. And somehow it came out that Naomi had a wig in the closet. And he said, well, let me, let me see it. And the man put it on. And uh, he was smoking a cigar, and there was this wig, and here is man, man is woman, sitting at the table. And it was typical of what he was about. It was fun. He was always making puns. He would be a sailor. He would wear a fur hat. He would be an Aussie, a Russian. You never knew what to expect with him. I was photographing a man in his studio. He got into his lounge chair. And as I was photographing him, he started to make hand gestures with his thumbing his fingers at me, sticking his tongue out. And he, finally, he put his finger in his nose and held it there. Well, I photographed him. And he loved the picture so much, he said to me, I want this to be the cover of my next catalog. Ele se concentrou na pintura, evitando fotografar, e escreveu sua autobiografia. Man Ray declarou que suas memórias deveriam ser ambíguas para o leitor médio. Eu sou assim, como em minhas pinturas. Apesar de seus trabalhos não venderem muito, ele finalmente recebia cachê de celebridade e tinha uma maior aceitação. Retrospectivas na Europa e nos Estados Unidos homenagearam seu trabalho. Man Ray havia se tornado uma figura respeitada e nostálgica. Em 1957, estudantes que protestavam contra o Dada invadiram uma exposição de Man Ray e destruíram um de seus metrônomos originais. O título era Object to be Destroyed. Esse era o título. Então, eles não tinham imaginação. Eles pegaram o meu título, eles usaram o meu título. Isso já estava muito bem. Quando a polícia disse para mim, você tem que eles, nós os encontramos. Eles os encontram. Oh, no, I said, maybe at their age I would have done the same thing. Apesar das muitas honras conferidas a Man Ray, um título insistia em escapar-lhe. I think at times he was bitter because he was, he was um, known as a photographer, first class photographer. Um, but what he was really interested in was being known for his artwork, which he considered the photography as art, but I think painting was his first love, and he took up photography uh, to make a living, and then was very inventive with it, because that was his nature. Devido a um problema no joelho, o mundo de Man Ray, quando ele envelheceu, ficou confinado aos arredores da Rio Ferru. I'm an old man now. In 60 years, you could do a lot of work. I did a lot of things in 60 years. My painting, my photography, my objects. I change all the time. I have periods when I do one thing, then for a few years I do something else. Mm -hmm. I'm a free man. I don't wait for a patron, for a boss. I am indifferent to things that do not interest me, but never would I attack them, especially in the creative art.